Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Path 11 podcast. I have a fascinating guest today, a guest who has traveled all over the world, who has seen some things that are just, are they're just going to blow your mind. Amazing stories. My guest today is Lionel Friedberg. He is an Emmy Award winning film and TV producer and writer. Lionel grew up in South Africa and began his career at the first TV station in Central Africa in Northern Rhodesia, now Zambia, in 1961. He worked as a director of photography on 18 feature films and wrote, produced, and directed for National Geographic, PBS, and national broadcast and cable networks, including the Discovery Channel, A&E, the History Channel. He's also a New York Times bestseller. He's based in Los Angeles now, but uh, he recently released a book called Forever in My Veins, How Film Led Me to the Mysterious World of the African Shaman. So his, his roots, and as you say in your book, and you actually actually kind of have a birthmark of Africa on your leg, um, that it, it is kind of branded within you, even though you are a, uh, a white male living in the West, that your true roots lie within Africa. So welcome, welcome to our show. There is so much of your life that I swear I could probably have you on for a full week. Um, so this is a challenging talk because there's so many things that I would love to bring to my audience, but I'm hoping that we can hit some of the highlights of who you are, what you've experienced, um, you know, in Africa, the stuff that you've seen through your filming, um, the shamans and, and all of the work that you have just experienced in your lifetime. So I would love for you to probably talk for most of this. I'm going to try not to ask too many questions because I think you're going to cover everything that I would like to talk about, but I'd love for you to introduce yourself to my audience and maybe uh, bring Bring them back to your childhood and lead them up to current day and how your journey um, kind of started. Well, thank you so much, April. It's really a great a pleasure and a privilege to be with you. Thank you for having me on your show. I guess I should start with the uh, where it all began, with my childhood. Um, I grew up in South Africa during the height of apartheid. Um, I'm now in my late 70s. So when, as a child, um, you know, apartheid was all around me. Uh, this unbelievably, completely uh, um, um, divided society was the world in which I, I grew up. The white, white communities and the black communities, the twain never met. It was forbidden by law. And the only exposure we whites ever had of black people were as, you know, these people were servants in our homes. They worked in factories. They worked in the gold mines. Other than that, there was very little contact between the white and black communities. And so white people knew very little about the culture, the history, um, about the white, the, the, uh, the black, the, the black neighbors. And by the way, there are 11 different, uh, uh racial, uh, tribal groups in South Africa. The, officially, South Africa has 11 languages, although most people of course speak English most of the time. Um, when I grew up, there were only two languages, and that was the languages of, of the white oppressors, if you like, uh, the English-speaking community and the Afrikaans-speaking community. And just a few years after I was born in 1948, uh, the Afrikaans community came to power, the, the, the nationalist government, and implemented this awful racial system called apartheid, which has now become a buzzword around the world for anything that is really unpleasant when it comes to the splintering of, of society, the, the separating of groups. It's become the noun that one uses today. Um, and it's an invention of the Afrikaners. And this is what I grew up with. So we, I, we all had nannies. Uh, we white folks, we know, we grew up with nannies and servants in our homes. And uh, as a child, one day, I must have been about uh, five or six years old. And this is where it really all begins uh, which I cover in my book. And that is my, my nanny said to me one day, well, I think it was her day off. And I was an only child. Uh, so, you know, I was the only kid at home. I had other friends, of course. But one day my nanny said to me, um, I'm going to visit a friend this afternoon. Do you want to come with me? And I said, sure, I'd love, love to do that. So she took me down the road. We were living at that time in a small town just to the east of Johannesburg. Uh, today, uh, the, the, uh, where that town is, it's by, it goes by the name of Kempton Park, is where the big international airport is. Anyway, she took me down to see her friend. 
And her friend lived uh, down the road from where we lived, and her friend was also a servant in a, a, a white home. All of these people lived in tiny little rooms in the backyard. They had nothing more than a little tiny room and a little, a little area where there was a toilet and a cold shower. Uh, and that's all the facilities they had. Um, and my nanny took me down there. And when we got there, I noticed there were three or four people waiting outside of her friend's door of her to her room. And, you know, we stood around waiting. And I mean, as these folks went in one by one, they would be inside the, her room for about 10 minutes. And then they'd come out carrying little satchels and little paper bags with something inside. I had no idea. And I said to her, what have they got? And uh, my nanny said to me, oh, they're carrying medicine. So I said, you know, I had no idea what she was referring to, medicine? Like, what do you mean? And she said, well, maybe you know, my friend will show you. So eventually we went inside this room and we met her friend, and her friend was a very, very nice lady. And I looked around the room, and typically in, as the servants' quarters, there were shelves and, you know, very, very sparse facilities inside the room. But there were shelves of bottles and containers and little boxes and little calabashes, which are little sort of, you know, they, they like um, um, empty, um, uh, almost like a, like a butternut, if you like, hollowed out, uh, they're dry, and people put things in there to contain stuff. And there were, there, were, there were twigs and barks and herbs and all sorts of weird things on these shelves. And um, uh, my friend, you know, said to her friend, my nanny said to her friend, explain what you do here. And so she said to me, well, what I do is I help people to get better. I'm a doctor. Now, you know, this is a woman who polished the floors, cleaned the cutlery, you know, helped cook the meals. How could she be a doctor? And I said, well, tell me, you know, like, what do you mean? And she pointed to the floor and she said, you see that? And I looked down on the floor and there was a grass mat about, I don't know, 12 inches square. And in the middle of this little grass mat was a, an animal skin bag. And she picked it up and she shook it like this. And I could hear clattering inside. And then she turned the bag upside down. And onto this grass mat fell all these little tiny bones and stones and pebbles and other little objects. And she said, these are the bones that speak to me through my ancestors and tell me what my patient needs to know. Now, I didn't understand any of this, but I was totally intrigued. It was like listening to a, you know, a fairy story. Uh, a bedtime fairy story. I said, yeah, yeah, and then what do you do? And she said, well, my ancestors speak to me. The ancestors make the bones fall in a special way. Now, when I say bones, I'm talking about little tiny objects, not huge, big uh, bones, you know, this side, little tiny things. Um, and, and the typical set of these shamans um, contain bones from wild animals as well as um, uh, animals like goats, a little tiny knuckle bone and so on. And also various pebbles and stones and whatever else that the shaman uses, which provides a channel for them to connect with their ancestral spirits. This is the, this is the paradigm. This is the modus operandi that they all use this. Anyway, she explained this to me. I had no idea what it was all about. I was very intrigued. My nanny, you know, spent about half an hour there. They chatted away and we went home and that was it. But the, the scene was impregnated in my mind. I, I could not forget it. All the smells of that room, there were weird smells that I couldn't identify. And I'm going to fast forward now because after my education, I, I went through in my entire high school um, in South Africa. And at the end of that, when I, when, I was, when I completed my high school, my father decided to leave South Africa. And the, the reason was uh, he moved around quite a bit, but he was, he was offered a job. He, he was trained as a watchmaker. He was originally from Latvia. Uh, he came to Africa from Latvia in the, in the 20s, eventually married my mother, and I was their only child. And my father decided it's time to get out of South Africa because apartheid was pretty nasty. So now I'm talking about the year 1960. And um, I thought, well, you know, I want to go with you because it sounds very exciting. And I'll tell you why I was so excited about it, because I was an avid film moviegoer. My mother, bless her soul, often went to the movies and always took, her, took me with her. So I fell in love with the movies as a child. Uh, and I always, all I wanted to do was one day to make movies. At the age of 11, I was given by a cousin of mine a, a, a used movie camera, 
those were the days long before the days of video of course we used to use film eight millimeter film and i made films about my my friends birthday parties sporting events at school you know that kind of stuff and so i was making movies uh, at the at the age of 11 uh, one of the, my most ambitious pr productions was called the glory of the garden because my mother was an avid gardener and i had music in the movie and you know it was just about boring stuff about gardening <laughs> <laughs> but my dream was to make films about you know, like the African Queen and King Solomon's Mines and Tarzan and all those wonderful things that I'd seen at the movies. So when they moved to Central Africa for my father to take this job that he applied for and got at a little store in a copper mining area of a place called Northern Rhodesia, which, which sits right to the south of the Congo, what was then the, the Belgian Congo. Um, I thought, well, I'm going to go with them and hopefully, you know, make movies up there. My mother said, don't be ridiculous, you know, get yourself an educate, go to university, get a degree. I didn't want to have any of it. I wanted to go to the middle of Africa and make movies about that kind of stuff, adventure films, you know, and I mean, I was just out of high school. So <laughs> I went up there with my folks and um, the, 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 when I got there, I was appalled because it was only a tiny town a big copper mine, lots of wealthy white miners, lots of not very wealthy black miners, because they were as exploited up there as they were anywhere else on the continent of Africa during the colonial era. And I, when I arrived there, I thought, what on earth am I going to do here? You know, I, I, I regretted having followed them up. And I thought, my God, you know, maybe I really ought to go back to South Africa. But at, at that point, and having completed high school, you know, I was deeply aware of the, uh, of the, the dark side of apartheid. And I really didn't want to go back uh, to South Africa and live in that society. Um, it had a film industry. Um, and there were uh, wonderful people in South Africa, but th the racial system was entrenched and it was legal. It was by law. The train did not meet. There were separate bridges, separate beaches, separate everything between the races. And I thought it was absolutely dreadful, as did many of my buddies, you know. But you couldn't talk about it because you weren't allowed to. Uh, anyway, so here I am in northern Rhodesia, and I didn't know what to do with myself. And now it is the time where Britain is giving up all its colonies. And so Northern Rhodesia was slated for independence and was going to be called the Republic of Zambia. And so that sounded fine. But, you know, again, I really didn't know uh, what my future would hold. And not long after I arrived there on, on, on what we call the Copper Belt, in the local newspaper, there was a newspaper that served all these mining towns, was a little ad for staff for a new television station. There was a British company. And I think there was some South African money involved as well. well. They were going to open a television station, the very, very first one in one of these mining towns to serve the white mining community at night. And during the day, it was agreed that they would provide educational broadcasts to uh, children living in the boondocks in, in schools far, far away in remote areas. And in the afternoon, there would be ethnic tribal programs. You know, people would come uh, and do the tribal music with dance and, and beat drums and all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, and the, the primary purpose, of course, of the station was to commercials in order to sell stuff because the white uh, community had a lot of money. Uh, they were they were they earned extremely good wages because the copper prices were very high those days. And of course, the first thing I did was to knock on the door and said, please give me a job. And like manna out of heaven. I was given a job at this little television station. In fact, I, I joined it before they actually went on the air. I, I was helping the engineers, you know, weld wires and putting the place together. And on 15th of December, 1961, we went on the air. And it was absolutely amazing. But after six months with this menial job that I had in the props department, I eventually said to the uh, manager of the studio, Put me behind the camera. All I want to do is to get behind the camera. And he said, all right, we'll try you out. And he did. And I was quite good at that. And he said, all right, we'll put you behind the camera permanently. So, so I became a studio cameraman. And it was a guess because in the morning were all these wonderful educational broadcasts. Afternoon, all these tribal groups used to come in and thump drums. It was absolutely wonderful. And at night, we'd had Leave it to Beaver and I Love Lucy and Bonanza and all that stuff from the States on film. But after three years, one day, we all got a little pink slip, 
And there were only about 30 people on the staff of the station. And it was decided by the, uh, the station that they, they, they were about to be taken over by the government. Why? Because Northern Rhodesia was becoming Zambia. And Zambia, under a black government, had decided to nationalize the station. They were going to take over the station. So it was agreed that all the white staff would be given notice to leave and the, uh, all the positions at the station would be given to, to local indigenous people, which is totally understandable. However, the big dilemma, of course, was what am I going to do with my life now? So we had a wonderful servant at home. We all had servants, even up there. Uh, and I, I went to him the next morning and I said to him, David, his name was David Fury. T terrific guy and he wasn't much older than I was I said David you know I've been asked to leave the station and I don't know what to do and he sort of thought and he, he said oh well uh, I, and I said I don't want to go back to, back to South Africa with apartheid you know I, I can't do that my dream was always to go to Hollywood but that was a dream of course an absolute unattainable dream at that point here I am living in the middle of darkest Africa and I want to go and work in Hollywood I mean, <laughs> how do you do that Anyway, David listened to my story and he said, I'll find someone who can help you. And a day later, he came back to me and he said, I found someone and we are going to visit uh, uh, Anganga. I didn't know what that was. I said, what is that? And he said, well, she's like a doctor. Well, in actual fact, she was exactly the same sort of person like that woman that I had met as a child back in South Africa years and years ago. That's what she did. Because on the appointed day, there we were, David and I, we arrived in my little secondhand car at her hut on the outskirts of a town in the middle of the boondocks, in the middle of nowhere. David knocked on the door of her hut. I'm telling you, in the African bush. And this little old lady, she was maybe five foot tall, all wrinkled up, shriveled up little woman. Uh, she was an albino. You know, she had a pigment, a skin pigment um, a, a problem. In other words, so that she was more more white than black. Usually those people are, are outcasts in the tribe, but some of them uh, are tolerated. Uh, but this particular lady was a practicing shaman. I didn't quite know what to expect or how the afternoon would go or what she would say or how she would help me. I had no idea, but I trusted David implicitly. So we went into her hut and she told us to sit on the floor. And there was that grass mat, which I recognized from my childhood back in South Africa. And on the grass mat was this bag of bones. And this little old lady said to me, blow into the bag. She didn't speak English. She, everything was being translated by David. She said, I better have us blow into the, into the bag, say my name. And then she took some snuff, which is ground up um, tobacco, and sprinkled it into the bag, turned the bag upside down, and these bones and stones and other little trinkets fell on the grass mat. And she peered over them like this, and she suddenly said, ah, it's like she was blinded by something, in shock. And she said to David, she mentioned something to David, and David said to me, she wants to know, she can't see anything. She can't see beyond the lights. What are all these lights that she's seeing? And I said, I, I have no idea. Well, in actual fact, what she was seeing probably were the lights of the te television station where I was working as a studio cameraman. And when she said that, I thought, thought well, you know, maybe she is seeing um, my, my working environment. I better listen to this woman and maybe what she's saying holds some truth to it. Well, she, for the next hour, just gaggled. She kept saying things that were like an like express train. It kept tumbling out. She made all kinds of predictions and she told David all sorts of things that he was furiously trying to translate and tell me. And I was trying to make notes and keep uh, a record of, of whatever she said. It was extraordinary. It was like uh, listening to, you know, this woman was just sprouting all of the stuff. And a lot of it, it was impregnated in my brain, but I did keep notes of some of the stuff. But what she did was she said to David, she said, he will one day go to a place on the other side of the big water. She didn't use the word ocean because Zambia is a landlocked country. There's no ocean there. She'd probably never seen an ocean in her life. But she said he will cross the big water and he will go into that direction. And she pointed to the north. He, he will go in that direction where there will be more lights and he will meet many famous people. And that's where he will one day go. 
I, I didn't know what she meant, but you know, she carried on. She said to David, he will one day also go to a world where there is only white, no color. It's a place completely white. But he must be very careful because one day in the bush, there will be a big beast. And this beast will be, will maybe almost kill him. He has to be very careful. You know, it's, that was a terrifying thing to hear because I didn't know what she meant. And she went on and on and on about all sorts of things. She said, in the big water, the water one day will almost, his, his life will almost be lost to the big water. And she said uh, to him also another thing that she said, which I shall never forget. And she held up her hand like this. This when she, when, 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 these, when these folks up there do this, it means that you're very, very close. Two people are very close, very friendly or whatever. She said, he will meet someone who was very close to the most evil man who ever lived. I had no idea what that meant. Nevertheless, you know, these are the sort of things that she was sprouting. Now, <clears throat> that's how it all began. Because as my life unfolded, all of these events that she predicted using these terms that had made no sense at that time, all turned out to be true. I eventually uh, had to go back to South Africa because there was nothing else for me to do in Zambia. And I joined the film industry there. But my intention was to go to North America and to <clears throat> uh, ideally work in Hollywood. Um, but at that time, it was very difficult for a white person to get a visa to come to the States because of South Africa's apartheid policies. Um, but I did get a visa to, to go to Canada. The Canadians were terrific. And I went to Canada um, to start a career, hopefully, in North America and with the intention of eventually ending up in L.A., in Hollywood. Um, and it was those were the before the days everyone traveled by sea, by air. We all went by sea. If you went abroad, you went by sea. So I, I emigrated from Cape Town to Southampton, and from Southampton, I, to Southampton in the UK, I was going to take a ship across to Montreal. And halfway along the journey from Cape Town to, to the UK, one night I was standing on the deck of the ship. I used to go up to the highest level and look over the stern of the ship, because the Southern Cross is like a, a very prominent um, constellation in the sky, kind of like the Big Dipper here. You can always see it. It's, a, it's like a reference point in the Southern Hemisphere, it's the Southern Cross. And every night, the Southern Cross was getting lower and lower on the horizon until it eventually started to dip beneath the horizon at the, you know, the, at, at the edge of the, of the ocean, behind the ship. And I, it was amazing for me because I suddenly realized, wow, I'm actually moving from one side of the planet to the other. I'm going from the south to the north. And I'm going on this big water, aren't I? And it reminded me of what that old lady had told me. I'm going on the big water, crossing the big water from south to north. That's what I'm doing. And, you know, it was kind of a revelation for me because I thought back to what this little old woman had told me. I said, how, how could she possibly have foreseen this? Nevertheless, to cut a very, very long story short, I ended up in Canada. I worked for the National Film Board. I came to LA eventually. I worked here, but my father became ill back in Africa. And as an only child, I, I thought it would be important that for me to go back to make sure that my mother was okay. And um, I got both of them to return from Zambia back to South Africa where my father would get proper medical care and my mother could retire there. Uh, so I ended up in South Africa and I stayed there, got married, had kids, whatever else. And I was a member of the film industry. And in 1967, uh, I get a phone call one day um, from a producer saying that there are three uh, Americans coming out on a hunting safari to a place called Mozambique. Now, Mozambique at that time belonged to Portugal. The whole of Africa belonged to Europe. Africa, as m most people know, during the colonial era, was carved up into little pieces and divided up between the Italians and the Spanish and the French and the Belgians and the British and the Germans even. You know, <laughs> the European powers owned the continent. Uh, until those colonial era period, that, that period came to an end. And of course, uh, it did in the 60s. Uh, they gave up all their colonies and all these uh, countries became independent nations of their, of, of, on their own. Um, but at, in 1967, Portugal was hanging on to Mozambique. 
Um, and so I, I was offered this job to go with three white guys from California on a hunting safari to Mozambique. And I thought, I'm going to do this only because I was intrigued. I was always very, very puzzled by where did people get kicks out of hunting wild animals and killing wild animals? Made no sense to me at all. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of hunters in South Africa as well, and it made no sense. I thought, well, what's the fun of killing an innocent wild animal? Well, you know, what, where do you get kicks out of that? So I said to the, the, this, this producer, I said, yeah, I'll take the job. I didn't tell him why. I said, yeah, I'll take the job. That sounds fine. I'll, I'll do a film about their safari, which is that's what they wanted. Um, but I only did it out of curiosity because here was a luxury, well-funded safari, you know, with portable um, ice boxes and martinis and whatever else um, in, the, in, in, in the African bush. Let me go and see what this is all about and why these people do what they do. And there were three very, very nice guys. The leader of, of, the, of this trio from, from the States was a guy called Spud Millen, who owned a huge toy company here in the States. And he'd made a fortune out of marketing around the world a thing called the hula hoop in the 50s, which was a fad that took the world by storm. He made millions out of the hula hoop. I even had one as a kid. And he also um, made a great deal of money out of um, de developing and selling the Frisbee, you know, uh, that toy that you throw around in the air. You know, everybody has a Frisbee at the beach. And so Spud made millions of dollars. He was an extremely wealthy guy and an extremely nice guy. And I met the three of them in Mozambique after they arrived from, uh, from California. And in we go to the jungle, the bush, to start the hunting safari. Now, all of these guys had licenses to shoot wild animals, lions and giraffes and wildebeest and zebra. I mean, it was appalling, but I needed to see this for myself. And, you know, and it was my job to cover this on film. You know, I had a very heavy movie camera and I was given uh, a local one of the one of the um, trackers was um, given to me as a carrier of my battery. The battery to power the camera was a big, heavy, wet cell thing. It was you know, and so he was uh, um, uh, um, given the task of carrying my battery for me, and I would go around with this camera and photograph this carnage, this absolute carnage of killing and maiming wild animals. Um, and one day it became the time for one of these hunters to to shoot an elephant. Now, nothing was more abhorrent to me than the idea of actually killing an elephant, but there we were. You know, came the day, and we were tracking this elephant herd on foot and uh we actually spent the night in the in the bush uh, we had to sleep in the bush because the herd was always ahead of us and the next day we managed to catch up with them and the white hunter who was leading the safari said to this white guy whose turn it was to shoot the elephant he picked out a, an old bull for him and he said you see that that animal on the on the edge of the herd that's the guy you aim for but shoot him right there on in the forehead that's that's the only clean kill if you don't get him there you know you're not going to kill him outright um so this guy was all gung-ho yeah he's got his big powerful rifle with his telescopic sights and you know he aims and i get a, i get myself behind him with my camera so that he's ahead of me and i've in my frame it's it's him and in the background is the herd and you know so i'm i'm ready for the shot he will shoot the elephant the elephant will drop dead and you know and i will see all this in the frame um my heart was thumping because just the idea of ab about to see this elephant being killed was for me not only a, a tragedy but I, I just it ripped my soul apart i mean i can't tell you how traumatic it was but there i was that was my job i had to i had to cover this on film so he shot and missed and the bull ran and the herd panicked. The entire herd panicked and started running in all directions. And in the middle of the herd was a female elephant, a cow with a little baby calf, a baby elephant. And she immediately realized that her baby might be threatened by this guy with a rifle because the elephants knew, you know, these hunters used to come there all the time shooting. So they were familiar with what the gunshots were and what they meant. And she looked at the, this guy standing in front of me with his rifle and she wanted to protect her baby and she started to charge him. Now he's right in front of me and the shot is I'm seeing him 
in the frame and in the background is this elephant running towards us, thundering. The earth was shaking. It was like an earthquake. And then this guy was jumped out of frame, but I, I was rooted. I was absolutely petrified. I couldn't move. And then the guy holding the battery kept whispering, whispering to me in Portuguese, you know, let's go, let's go, let's go. But I was, I was absolutely frozen. And here this elephant was running as fast as she could towards me. I was not sure whether she was actually aiming for me now or, or wanting to, you know, stampede and kill me. She was really after the hunter who'd now run away. But she was now running directly towards me and the camera. And about when she was about six to eight feet away from me, the leader of the safari behind me, Wally Johnson was his name, he shot. I heard this bang behind me. And he hit her right between the eyes. And she fell down to, on her knees, six feet a, 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 in front of me. I'm still running film. And she collapsed onto her knees and her eyes locked with mine. And the most incredible thing happened because I knew that she and I made a spiritual connection at that very moment. I don't think she had thought of me as the enemy or as the one responsible for putting her baby in danger. And we just made this incredible connection and she fell onto her side and then her eyes glazed over and she died. And eventually I stopped filming and I was shaking. I was terrified. More, but it wasn't so much a matter of me being scared and in terror because I could have been killed very easily. But I felt this incredible connection with the being, the spirit of this, this amazing animal. She had been murdered in front of me. And you know, um, it was only that night back at camp where we, was, where we were processing the day's events with lots of booze flowing and, you know, beer flowing and martinis flowing and ice tinkling that we were talking about the day. And, and it suddenly hit me that night in the camp. I thought, oh, my God, this is what that old woman had seen. She had told me, she said, beware of the big beast in the bush. It may, your life will be in danger. She had foreseen this. So this was another one of those little prophecies of her that suddenly came to mind that reminded me that, you know, this lady had basically predicted a lot of things in my life that may come true. Um, and over the years, this I'm talking about 1967 now when this event happened, but later on, so many of the other things that she had told me came true. And it wasn't like taking, you know, the glass slipper in Cinderella and trying to force it onto the, the foot of the ugly sisters and making it fit. Um, it wasn't like that. Everything fitted perfectly with the, her predictions as my life unfolded. Because um, I'll, I'll give you an exa another example. This, this, when she, this, this thing about this white world that she told me about. In 19, 1990 um, or 91, uh, I was here living in the States. I moved to, to, to California permanently with my family in 1985, primarily to get away from, uh, from apartheid, but also because I always wanted to return to LA and work in, work in Hollywood, work in the film industry. And I was uh, uh, very lucky to get a job on an amazing science series for PBS uh, called The Infinite Voyage. And um, in 91, I was given the task of doing a film, a scientific investigation into whether global warming was actually taking place and whether the ozone hole was a threat to life on Earth and whether there was any way of taking the temperature of planet Earth and seeing whether the environment was being affected and impacted by human activity. So that's what, that, that was the, the thrust of the show. The show was called Secrets from a Frozen World. Down in the Antarctic, you know, there are no freeways, there are no cities, there are no human habitations. So if you check the ecosystems down there and the wildlife and you do ice cores and you do sediment cores and you test the atmosphere, you can take the temperature of the planet. It's like putting a thermometer into Mother Earth and seeing, are you well or are things not so good? Are things not going so well? You know, are, uh, are things in, are, is the environment in trouble? Is the atmosphere in trouble? Are the oceans becoming more acidic? What's happening to the natural world? The Antarctic is, the, is an ideal place to, to, to check out those things. So that's what the film was about. And it was 
um, I was on an icebreaker research ship, and it was on Christmas Day, um, 1991. Uh, and we were way down south, so far south in actual fact. And in, in the south, at the end of the year, this was in December, the sun never set. It was perpetual daylight because the sun never went beneath the horizon. You know, you'd have, it, it would go down, dip uh, to, towards the horizon and then come up again. So there would be like an hour of twilight time. But other than that, it was 24 hours of daylight. Anyway, the captain, because it was Christmas Eve, had stopped the ship um, and everybody was partying and you know he's basically all the experiments came to an end to, to celebrate christmas at sea when i say at sea we were actually in thick pack ice the the ocean was completely covered by pack ice and i decided to go up on the deck and you know just think about it because i kept copious notes throughout my life so i was going to keep i was going to update my diary and um to make notes of the events of the day um and i went up there with my diary it was pretty chilly and I was all wrapped up and I sat on the deck of the ship. The hull of the ship was red. There was a white superstructure. But other than that, everything around me was just ice and icebergs. Yeah. And again, it hit me. The whole world is white. The sea was white. The sky was white. And it, I realized that this is what that old lady had seen. I would come to a world where there is no color. There is only white. And that's where I am. How did she see this? How could she possibly have foretold this? She had no idea what the Antarctic was. She had no idea about what went on in the Southern Hemisphere. And yet she saw all these images. Well, it was extraordinary. And time and time again during the course of my life, and I, had, I have made films about, and I've been, I, I don't want to sound boastful, and I don't want to sound arrogant about it at all. I really don't. But I've been very, very lucky and very blessed to have had an extraordinary life. I've made movies about an amazing variety of topics. You know, one of my favorite films was working with NASA on the story of the Voyager spacecraft, which went from Earth to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. I mean, who gets to, 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 to go inside that world and meet all of those amazing engineers and astronomers and get to know those people? And you talk about foreign other worlds and exploring the solar system. It's, it's amazing, you know? And so I've done... And I've done ethnographic films and I've done films on, you know, uh, social issues and you name it. But it's it's been an amazing career. So um, I, you know, um, I, I I've often find it difficult to get my thought trains in order because it's like this kaleidoscope of, of memories keep flooding back to me all the time. But, you know, um, when I realized at that time that this, this woman had foretold or foreseen this environment, I started referring back to my notes or my memories about other things that she had said. And here I'm going to give you another example. We now go backwards in time a little bit to 1983. This is before I had left South Africa. I was doing a series of films on the history of South African Airways, which actually began as a private airline in 1929 and ran out of money in 1934. And then the government took, took it over and renamed the airline. It was originally called Union Airways and renamed the airline South African Airways. And it eventually became a very, very efficient an, uh, airline with links between South Africa and countries all over the world, run very, very efficiently. Yes, it was government owned and a lot of people sort of brandished it as the apartheid airline, which to some extent was true, but it really it didn't carry out apartheid policies. It carried both white and black passengers. And so I was very proud of that airline, and I was very happy to do a documentary series about its history, particularly as 1984 was going to be its 50th anniversary. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to find um, some footage that went back to the foundation of the airline. And in after the airline was nationalized in the early 30s, um, they ordered three brand new aircraft from a company in Germany called the Junkers Company. And they ordered uh, Junkers JU-52, which were airliners that had an engine in the nose, prop, of course, and one on each wing, and sat about 14 passengers, accommodated about 14, 14 passengers. And the big thing was, how do you fly um, an airliner with limited range all the way down from Germany? to Johannesburg through Africa 
when there were no weather forecasting stations, there were no alternative airports to land at, there were very few airfields anyway. How do you refuel these airplanes? So the delivery flight for those three aircraft were was in itself a major story and an adventure and you know something that I could devote an entire hour to in the series. How do you do that? And <clears throat> we learned through our research that one of the pilots who, who delivered one of those airplanes from Germany to South Africa was still alive. Not only that, but he was an amateur cinematographer and he had taken his personal movie camera with him on the flight and had shot footage of the delivery flight. And I thought, that's amazing. I've got to interview him and I've got to get, I've got to have access to that footage if it still exists to put in the movie. And I had some amazing researchers work with me and it was found out that he, this man, his name was Hans Bauer, B-A-U-R, and he had retired to a little tiny village near Munich in Bavaria. And that the film was in a vault, it still existed, was in a vault in Frankfurt. Well, I, was, I couldn't tell you how excited I was about this. I had, a, I had to get to him and I had to get to that film, which we eventually did. So eventually I'd arrived in Germany with my crew some public relations people, and uh, we were even met by a man from the German government, um, the foreign office, who was going to be my translator and who was going to accompany us to go and interview this guy at his home um, and to facilitate the, the interview because apparently, you know, he was, a, he was a big deal. This guy flew a delivery flight in the 30s. He was very well known in aviation circles. And had, you know, was well known um, for his war record. Um, obviously, he'd been a pilot with the Luftwaffe. But that's not what I was interested in. I was interested in that delivery flight. Anyway, came the, uh, the time for us to, uh, to go and do the interview. Um, we were based in, we were in Frankfurt. And to get to Fra from Frankfurt to Munich is, is just a few hours drive on those amazing German autobahns. And uh, so off we go, you know, no speed limit. <laughs> Those autobahns are amazing. And uh, the, we, we got to this little village and we stayed at a little hotel that night. And um, there must have been about, I don't know, maybe a dozen of us in the crew, public relations people, the sound guy, the, the camera crew, whatever else. And the, the, the man from, from the foreign office, from the, from the German government, um, sidled up to me that night. And he said to me, he said, you know, uh, Lionel, his English was perfect and he was going to be my translator for the interview. He said, how much do you really know about uh, Hans Bauer, his, his, his background? I said, well, you know, I only know that, you know, he shot that film, which we did have access to eventually, by the way. We got access to it in the vaults in that lab in Frankfurt and we could select parts and they, they copied them for us. But that's all I knew about him. And he said, but there's more to his story than that. It, it's, it's, his, his fame is not only about that delivery flight. Do you know anything about his real background? And I said, no, I don't. Why? What is there to know? And he leaned over to me and, and like this, and he said to me, he said, come over here. He said, um, this is like one o'clock in the morning. We'd all had a lot of wine to drink. And he said to me, uh, he was Adolf Hitler's personal pilot. Just like that. And I tell you, I sobered up instantly. When I heard that, I thought, oh my God, how do you deal with that? Wow. And so it comes the next day, and we welcome to his home by his third wife. It was his third wife at the time. And we go inside the house, and there comes this, this guy down the stairs on a stick, you know, with a cane. And he welcomed me. And the minute I shook his hand, I was aware of the fact that I was one handshake away from Adolf Hitler. However, I was going to hide my alarm or whatever, or the fact that I was aware of this. And, you know, we did the interview. He was as sweet as can be. The interview went extremely well. He told me all about that amazing delivery flight and how they arranged in advance to have kerosene and various um, airfields that had been scratched into the ground uh, to, uh, along the way down the whole length of Africa. And on and on, at the end of the interview, he says to me, uh, you know, I said, Danke, you know, thank you very much. Terrific interview. And then he says to me, um, 
come over here. And I get up and he, he takes me and he, t he shows me a, a photograph around the corner next around the living room on the way to the, to the bathroom. There's a picture of him and Adolf Hitler and, and, and the, one of the exact same aircraft that we've been talking about in this interview, the Ju-52. And he says, Does it, this is me and that's the Ju-52. Didn't mention Hitler. <laughs> And, and I said, yeah, that's is very interesting. Thank you. That's very interesting. And then he looks at me and he says, uh, schnapps, when it means you want a drink? And I said, yeah. So he says to his wife, bring some booze, which he does. And he says, do you want to know more about that, my background? And I said, yes, please, I really do. <laughs> and we sat down on his couch. I sat right next to him. His wife brought him all these photograph albums. And in these leather-bound photograph albums, beautifully bound, was the entire history of the inside of the Third Reich. This guy and Adolf Hitler and sitting at a table with Adolf Hitler and Mussolini and Goebbels and, and Goering and all of these henchmen and these, these, these you know, the, the inner workings of Adolf Hitler's Third Reich. All these images, he kept marvelous photographs of all of that. And he just told me about how he and Adolf Hitler were the greatest of friends. In fact, he showed me a photograph of his first wedding to his first wife. And he, Adolf Hitler gave him his wedding party in Adolf Hitler's apartment in Munich. That's how close they were. Now, Hitler, as you may or may not know, trusted nobody. He, you know, he, he, he didn't trust any of his close con uh, um, um, uh, members of, of the Reich because he always knew that his life could have been in danger. But, he, but Hans Bauer was his confidant. He would tell Hans Bauer everything. And it was extraordinary, the, the relationship and the closeness between those two men. And he was quite happy to explain all this to me as we drank wonderful Kirschwasser and Slivovitz and all sorts of things for the rest of the afternoon. Me sitting next to this guy, and he's telling me all of this stuff. And it was only at the end of the day where we packed up, rolled up all the cables, you know, put all the all the gear away, and were driving away from his home, you know. And there he was outside of his house with his wife, waving goodbye to us, just a little old couple saying goodbye. And it hit me again like a ton of bricks. As we were yep, driving there's away. There's another prediction that she made. That's 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 what she meant. I right. would meet the man who was very close, that close, to the most evil man who ever lived. She was right. Yeah. And again and again and again, this had happened throughout my life. And so that's the glue, if you like, her predictions that hold my story together yeah. in my book. My book is a kind of memoir, if you like, about some amazing things that I've done. I've done films with people who have had near-death experiences. I've done ethnographic films. I've done series on the history of the tribes of South Africa, where I met many, many more shamans, by the way, who go by the name, if I didn't mention it earlier, go by the name of Sangomas. And let me tell you something very interesting. When I did the tribal series, which was called The Tribal Identity, this was in the 70s in South Africa for television, I met a number of Sangomas, and, and very, every now and again, when I'd meet one, I'd say, look, can you, can you throw the bones for me? And always, without fail, when they did that, the very first thing they would say to me was, we don't understand it, but what is the spirit of the Ndlovu that is with you? And Ndlovu is the Zulu word for elephant. Mm. What is this Ndlovu spirit that is with you all the time? Time and time again. So that that dear elephant that was murdered in front of me that day, her spirit and mine are Merged. connected yeah. like, like that. They are. Wow. And I know that she's seen me through all kinds of trouble. You know, I nearly, yeah, she, another thing this old woman had told me was I'd almost die in the big, in the big ocean. Well, I was on a research ship in uh, also, I think this was in the 70s, um, in the South Atlantic, where we almost capsized in the South Atlantic in a storm that is indescribable. And again, at the end, at the, after that happened, you know, I remember this is what this woman said to me, the big water, it will always kill you, you know. And again and again and again, uh, this kept, her predictions kept coming up. So what else can I say, April? It's just that my life has been extraordinarily rich and amazing. And I keep harking back that my, my touchstone is that afternoon sitting in a mud hut in Central Africa, um, and this little old lady and her bones, you know, predicting all of these things. Right. It's been unbelievable.
Yeah. So if if our listeners would like to hear even more of the stories that you captured in your book, and the book again is Forever in My Veins, How Film Led Me to the Mysterious World of the African Shaman, um, I highly recommend that you take the time to purchase Lionel's book, um, get a nice blanket, you know, cuddle up with a nice hot tea and uh, just continue to read because the stories that you shared with us today, I mean, are just a few of the many that you have in your memoir here. So I have to thank you so much for taking the time to share this. And I think, you know, what your stories, uh, what they mean, I guess, to the listener, to the reader of your book is showing that there is such a grander world than what we can really see. And yes, yes, and, and, you know, life really is a mystery. So thank you so much for being a guest on the Path 11 podcast. It was wonderful to listen to you. I could listen to you all day. It's like, you're such a wonderful storyteller. So thank you so much. And where can people find uh, your book? Would you like to direct them to your website? Where can they find you? Yes, they, they can go to my website. My website is, is my full name, Lionel, L-I-O-N-E-L, F-R-I-E-D-B-E-R-G.com, LionelFriedberg.com. They can read excerpts from the book uh, there. But the book is now available on Amazon.com. They can get it from Barnes & Noble online. It's, it's, it, it'll, if they order it now, it'll be delivered. It only goes onto the shelves of bookstores, if the book, those bookstores that are going to be open uh, on the 29th of this month. Um, so, But if they go now to Amazon, they can pre-order it and it'll be delivered to them on the 29th. Thank you. That's exactly it. Yes. Um, yes. Well, and wonderful. It's available now. And it's been a great pleasure talking to you. I just want people to, I wanted to share my story because I want people to have hope. There yeah. is so much more to life than the dark side of things, you know. And I have learned this time and time again. Um, life is an extraordinary thing and the cosmos is really amazing. I've learned this and I want people to share that adventure with me. So thank yes. you for having me on today. You're so welcome. And I'm so glad that you put all of your adventures and stories into print to share them. So that's a wonderful gift to all of us. All right, everyone. Again, this is Lionel Friedberg. Thank you so much for tuning in, listening, watching on Path 11 TV. Remember, uh, if you are more of a visual person, you'd like to see who I'm speaking to, you can head on over to path11tv.com and you can watch the video podcast there. So take care, everyone. And until next time and until my next guest.